Of all the heroes in Norway and Germany, none can compare to the one known by two names, Siegfried slash Sigurd, a hero that is in many ways two heroes with the same core idea. Siegfried and Sigurd follow much the same story and themes as one another, but with important distinctions in their narratives. But how powerful are they? Well, because we're looking at figures that are two branches of the same core, I'll discuss both of them in this video, but I'll make sure to keep it clear as to what is specific to each, so if you want to use this as a reference for either or both together, you can. For the purpose of this video, I read through Siegfried's journey in the Nibelungenlied. I tried to find the Rosgarten story, but it's, it was hard to find anywhere, but I already have the basic gist in me, so I already know what happens. And Sigurd's story as attested primarily in the Prose Eda, Poetic Eda, and most notably the Volsunga Saga, as well as all the fluff that they also in. So to start, I guess I'll discuss each of their stories before we get into things to get some groundwork. Beginning of course with Siegfried, because I am German. Siegfried is a man described as wearing a coat of black, a silky cloth, and a hat of sable. His quiver was made of panther skin, and his clothing was sewn with otter skin. Siegfried is considered a great hero who accomplished many great deeds, namely killing a dragon and washing himself with its blood, and intended to take the maiden Kriemhild as his wife. He travelled to Worms to ask a hand in marriage, and was met with their brother, King Gunther. Siegfried lived in Worms for a long while then, aiding them in battle against invading Saxons. Eventually, King Gunther desires the hand of Brunhild, the Queen of Isenstein in Iceland. However, she is no ordinary woman. She is an Amazonian-esque warrior queen. She requires any man best her in three challenges to better, and those who fail are met with death. To aid him, Gunther asks Siegfried for his assistance, and Siegfried does so under the condition that he gets to be with Kriemhild. After aiding Gunther, Siegfried lives with Kriemhild happily, and Gunther lives with Brunhild happily. Well, Brunhild kind of manhandles Gunther whenever he tries to sleep beside her, and Siegfried has to help him with that too. Eventually, however, Kriemhild ends up spilling the beans to Brunhild over what happened while they're arguing over whose man is better. As a result, Brunhild organizes the death of Siegfried for what he did. She gets the hero warrior Hagen to perform the deed getting the trust of Kriemhild. You see, Siegfried is borderline unkillable, outside of a weak point. Worried for his safety, Kriemhild paints on his clothing where that weak point is, and tells Hagen to keep a lookout and ensure that it isn't struck. Betraying that trust, Hagen spears Siegfried from behind when his guard is down, piercing his heart. Before the end, Siegfried strikes Hagen one last time, and says his final words towards his betrayers as he passes. Siegfried's story is very similar. He's also a great hero. Sigurd Zygmundersson, as he's attested, aided the dwarf Regan to kill his brother, the dragon Fafnir. After doing this and being informed by birds of Regan's intent to betray him, Sigurd killed him as well, and went on his merry way. Sometime after this, Sigurd encountered a man surrounded by weapons and freedom. When he took off his helmet, however, he found it was actually a woman. Depending on the versions, this woman is either a Valkyrie by the name of Sigurd, who does not show up again later, or is Brynhilda, a woman whom eventually Sigurd falls in love with and swears himself to. Either way, even if it is Sigurd, Sigurd does end up meeting Brynhilda eventually anyway, and does fall in love with her. However, then he has his memories of her taken away from him, and he now wants to marry Gudrun, the sister of King Gunnar. To do so, however, he is told to win the hand of Brynhilda for Gudrun. She will marry whichever man breaks through the ring of fire that surrounds her. Sigurd swaps places with Gunnar and does it for him, sleeping beside her without ever giving her the dicking. Sometime after, Gudrun argues with Brynhilda over whose man is better and reveals a secret of what really happened. Brynhilda basically has her Joker arc, locked up and chained and completely mad and insane. She tells Gunnar that Sigurd rammed her into the mattress when he never did, and Gunnar organizes Sigurd's death, getting his littlest brother to kill him in his sleep. That brother then dies when Sigurd throws his sword at him, and Sigurd too is left dead from his wounds. As you can see, their stories are very similar, but there are important points of differentiation. Siegfried's battle against the dragon largely goes unattested, and his trials with Brunhild are very different to what Sigurd does for Brynhilda. Sigurd also meets Brynhilda prior and gets together with her, while Siegfried instead gets involved in a war against the Saxons. But in terms of what they can do in a fight, they're actually still somewhat different. Let's start again with Siegfried and what he brings to the table. Siegfried wields the sword Balmung, which is so sharp that it could always cut through helmets without fail which is essentially impossible to accomplish with a sword, and the way it words this implies that Balmung will do this regardless of who is wielding it. He also possesses a javelin with sharp edges, and the sword of Nibelung, which we know basically nothing about. At all times, he also carries a shield and a bow. This bow is so powerful that any other man would require a windlass mechanism to pull it, or a windlass motion, and possesses arrowheads that are handbreadth in size, or roughly 10 centimeters which are so deadly that whatever he shoots must needs die soon. 
whatever that means. It basically tells me that it mauls the opponent so badly they'd better hope they die soon due to the pain. Finally, what makes Siegfried really stand out from Sigurd, he possesses the Cloak of Darkness, a cloaky one from the Dorth Alberic. It adds a strength of 12 men to his own, and it also makes him completely invisible as well. From what I know, some translations imply that this means it multiplies his strength 12 times over instead, which would make more sense. Sigurd, meanwhile, has a much smaller but potentially more impressive arsenal. He has his own magical sword, Gram, a blade that Odin stuck into a tree and was pulled out by his father. Later, Sigurd would wield it, and with it he could slice an anvil in half, and when he laid it into a river, a piece of wool floating by is sliced in two from touching the edge. Neither Helmut nor Horberg could stop Gram, and with it he cleaved a man from Helmut down in half. And that man was wearing full armor. Even when throwing it, it could cut a man in half, and Sigurd did that with a chuck he made after being mortally wounded. Oh, and it's also five feet long. Along with that, he possesses the Helm of Terror, which Fafnir the Dragon wore that makes all animals afraid. It probably has some supernatural fear abilities, but we never actually see it do anything. Finally, Sigurd rides the horse Grani, offspring of Odinsteed Sleipnir, and thus the grandson of Loki, not going to elaborate. This horse would only ride when ridden by Sigurd, and could carry two treasure chests full of gold, or in the Prose Eater, the entire horde of Fafnir. This is the greatest hoard of gold there ever was, and Grani rode with it unencumbered. While I'd love to get this calc, it'd be hard to really get any idea as to how much gold it is, but just know that it would be pretty fucking impressive for a horse. Also, he has a sword Hroti, which we know nothing about. Plenty impressive on both sides. Oh, also both have the full treasure trove of the dragon they slew, but that's not really important for verses. They differentiate far more in powers, however, as it stands, Right now, both have a magical sword and a piece of clothing with supernatural powers, but their natural abilities are completely different. Siegfried only possesses one supernatural power, that being his very skin. Famously, Siegfried bathed in the blood of the dragon, his skin became like horn and no weapon could cut him. In fact, no weapon at all can harm Siegfried, implying that not only his own Balmung could harm him, even some of the strongest weapons of his time, like a trebuchet, would not be able to harm Siegfried. I mean, you could whack this and say this includes even the gods' weapons, but the gods are never even mentioned in the story, so they might not even exist. His skin is basically completely invincible within his world, with two exceptions. In the tale of Rosengarten, which as I said I couldn't find anywhere for some reason, it was able to be melted with fire, specifically super hot dragon fire. And of course, Siegfried possesses the second most well-known weak point in all of mythology and folklore, second only to Achilles' heel. His back. When he was bathing in the dragon's blood, a single leaf fell on his back, leaving a tiny gap between his shoulder blades. Now this point is not actually visible, and nobody knows of it without being told prior by Siegfried or someone Siegfried has told. In fact, it needs to be marked specifically for it to be exploited. A spear thrown at this point by the supernaturally strong Hagen pierces through the vulnerable area and into his heart, killing him. Though even with that, he was still strong enough to chase after his killer, catching up to him and delivering a blow on him. So while it is a weakness, Siegfried can still keep fighting with his heart pierced anyway. Sigurd, on the other hand, also got powers on the dragon blood, just not from bathing in it, but drinking it. When he drank the dragon's blood, he gained the ability to understand bird speak, and it was these birds that told him of Regan's plan to betray him. Other than that, Sigurd's only other physical ability is that his eyes are so intimidating that his killer had to try three times to kill him. This was without the helmet terror on, and this was while Sigurd was asleep. Sigurd's other abilities are runes he learned from either Sigurd or Brynhilde. These runes are the following. He has healing signs that, well, heal, winning runes that give him the blessing of the god Tyr, helping him escape dangerous situations, birth runes to help women in labor, wave runes that alter the ways to guide whatever boat he's into safety, sickness runes that transfer sickness from people into trees, speech runes that allow him to speak any language, and mind runes that make him smarter than others. Now he has to draw these runes out, and they're hardly useful in battle at all given what they are, aside from the winning one which requires him to write runes on his sword hilt, furrow, and flat, and call on tier twice, and the danger escaping rune which requires him to write runes on a horn, and the back of his hands and nails, bless, and then empty the cup, which would contain the evil that intends to harm him that he throws out. So basically, he writes runes so that the evil that would harm him goes into the cup, he pours it out, and now he's escaped danger. Oh, and Sigurd can take the appearance of another man. Clearly, Siegfried's armored skin is the better ability of the bunch, but Sigurd potentially wields a bunch of runes we don't know that are just lost to time. 
Still, very impressive on either side. Now let's talk about skill. Siegfried was the best knight of worms whenever they would engage in knightly games, as well as a capable captain who can steer a ship, and the greatest hunter. He killed Schilbrung and Nibelung for their treasure, used Balmung to kill 12 giants and 700 warriors on his own, and slew a dragon in a fight. With 1,000 warriors and his 12 men at arms, he was able to defeat the Saxons who had on their side 40,000 warriors. He defeated 30 knights at once, right after defeating King Ludegast in battle, and single-handedly conquered the entire nation of Nibelungenland, becoming their new sovereign in one night. In doing so, he also bested a giant that could shatter his shield plates in one swing. Sigurd, meanwhile, doesn't quite have as many feats like that, but he does have some skill. He still killed Fafnir, though he explicitly did so by taking him by surprise and stabbing him from beneath while hiding. He did kill all the sons of King Hunding on his own, though. He's also stated to be an expert in swordplay, spear and javelin throwing, shieldwork, archery, riding, and chivalry. But now let's talk about the feats of strength and speed, starting with speed because there's only one feat between either of them. Siegfried was able to row a boat so fast that it looked as if wind was blowing it, who in the time of a day and night rowed 200 rests away. That's not something we can use, but he travelled from Iceland to Nibelungenland in Germany within a single night, requiring him to row his boat at 26.3 meters per second. That might not seem insane to a lot of versus debaters, but the fastest Usain Bolt has ever run clocks in at 12.3 meters per second. Siegfried wasn't even running, but rowing a boat so fast that it was twice as fast as Usain Bolt has ever run. And Usain Bolt only achieved that for a short duration, while Siegfried kept this up for an entire day straight, meaning Siegfried's muscles are strong enough to propel a boat and his entire body at those speeds, so most likely he can run at speeds similar if his muscles can propel his mass at that pace. Sigurd, meanwhile, is the only one with a feat of durability, which shouldn't be a surprise given Siegfried can't really have feats of durability when nothing at all can hurt him. So, but no one even tries. Sigurd was able to ride through fire unharmed. Okay, that's not that impressive. Anyway, strength. Neither of these two have huge feats of strength on their own, but Sigurd is so big and amazing that he's mistaken for a god, and Siegfried was able to hit someone with a shield so hard the shield shattered. That's most of what they have. Scaling wise, however, well, we can scale Siegfried to Brunhild and Sigurd to Fafnir. In the latter's case, Fafnir is synonymous with the dragon that Siegfried killed, so most likely any feats that Fafnir possesses are in lost writings about Siegfried as well. Starting with Siegfried, Siegfried normally is weaker than Brunhild, as he struggles to match her strength even when wearing the Cloak of Darkness. But with the cloak, Siegfried's strength rises to match her. Brunhild can casually wield a lance weighing three and a half weights, a weight being something three men can scarcely hold, making it a lance that ten men would struggle to hold, and she just carries it fine. She could also throw the spear so hard that sparks burst forth. It even says that it would have killed Siegfried if he didn't have his cloak, though I'm not sure on this claim because Brunhild isn't able to kill Siegfried herself later in the story, and the cloak doesn't actually make him more durable, so I'm not sure how it works. Most impressively, however, is that Brunhild threw a rock. This rock was so heavy that 12 men could barely lift it, and she tossed it 12 fathoms, and then jumped in full armor even further than that. I actually made the mistake of telling my cow guy it was a rock that 20 men couldn't lift, so, um, oops. Basically, I redid what he did with the adjusted size, but thanks, Big Speedy, for the cow guy. Just substituted one number. So I hope I didn't fuck it up. To accomplish this, Brunhild would have output 92,384.5 joules or 92 kilojoules, solidly within wall level. Siegfried accomplishes the same throw, but better, and the same jump, while also carrying King Gunther on his back, and better. This is probably not far off the force Siegfried to be able to survive from a trebuchet rock being launched at him as well, so it is probably consistent. Sigurd, meanwhile, scales to Fafnir, and keep in mind I would consider this feat very viable for Siegfried as well. Fafnir is so large he can sit 30 fathoms above a lake and drink from that platform, 30 fathoms being about 180 feet or 54 meters. His size is so great that he shakes the earth all around the land by moving, outputting enough energy to cause an earthquake with a Markelly intensity of 5. Markelly? That's not how it's pronounced. Again, thank you Big Speedy. The energy needed to produce this kind of earthquake would be equivalent to 476.88 tons of TNT, performed just from Fafnir moving within the city block level range. This is a level of power that is likely something Siegfried also scales to as mentioned twice now, as Fafnir is actually considered quite an average dragon, so even if Siegfried's dragon was a different individual, it was likely of a similar scale. 
Whether these two stories take place in the same world or not is hard to say by the way, seeing as they're both Germanic legends and while similar they do have enough differences that there'd be no contradiction if they were in the same lands. But if you took that and took the 12 times multiplier from the Cloak of Darkness, well, keep in mind, the order of events for Siegfried was that he killed the dragon and then won the cloak. So that means he scales to 476 tons of TNT normally, same with Sigurd. But Siegfried can put on the Cloak of Darkness, multiplying his strength 12 times over, rising up to 5.7 kilotons of TNT at the cusp of small town to regular town level. And that's actually all there is to say. Siegfried and Sigurd most likely scale both into the multi-city block range, with a superhuman level of speed capable of slaying hundreds of warriors on their own. Siegfried uniquely can raise his strength up to town level. Siegfried possesses indestructible skin aside from one spot and against fire, as well as the ability to amplify his strength and turn invisible. Sigurd possesses the ability to speak to birds, speak all languages, control the way slightly, heal himself, remove sickness, gain divine blessing, avoid danger, shapeshift, help in childbirth, and cause supernatural terror into his enemies. That wasn't quite as long as any of the Arthurian ones, but I still wanted to do it. Siegfried is a pretty special hero to me. I am proud of both my Chinese and German heritage, but Chinese heroes tend to still be worshipped in many ways and discussing them in this manner is really uncomfortable for me. But Siegfried isn't like that, so this time I could meld my heritage with my passion for verses together and give you this video. So if you ever wondered how strong Siegfried and Sigurd are, there's your answer. Also as a little bonus bit, if you want, it would potentially be fair to scale Beowulf to the multi-city block Fafnir feed. Fafnir isn't specifically mentioned in the Epic of Beowulf, but Sigurd is alluded to as a dragon slayer, so you could argue that because Fafnir is described as pretty average, that Beowulf's dragon should be comparable, though it is notably much smaller than Fafnir. Still, you can potentially argue that Beowulf would scale to the several hundred tons of TNT feed. Anyway, I hope you guys all enjoyed. Have a good one.